stories. So a good number of biblical passages had an oral background, though not all of them. Letters of, a letter is always a letter without any, uh, what do you call this? or probably in some, uh, what do you call this, uh, gathering or formation or catechesis and so on. So that means the oral version continued to develop. So even if they have put them into writing, you cannot stop basically all tradition from going on and proceeding. You can have, unless people will stop talking, and that, that's the only time that it will stop. Here are examples of oral background regarding the Old Testament. Regarding the stories of the patriarchs, particularly the sagas, which is basically understood as a short, easily memorized, simple folk story that had little in the way of plot or character development. So it was handed down from generation to generation by word of mouth, in the same way that maybe in our particular culture, we also have some stories like that that has been passed on. So, of, of course, example of sagas that we have in the, in the Bible, particularly the Old Testament, are the stories about Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the, in the book of Genesis. Another example is the Psalter, the Psalms. They were originally some prayers in poetic forms that were also later, down, later, later on was put into writing. For example, Psalm 18, and if you compare Psalm 18 and the second book of Psalm 22, you will find two versions of the same psalm. Of course, the, the divergence has something to do with the fact that they were, uh, even if they were already put into writing, like in the case of Psalm, 1, psalm 18, it continued on. That's why the, uh, the version that was uh, gotten by the author of the second book of Samuel is probably slightly different from what you find, what is written in Psalm 18. So it's just like, of course, a concrete example in our time is just like, for example, learning a song by hearing. And sometimes when you notice, sometimes the lyrics are not exactly how it was in the original. Because you, don't, you didn't check the original, so you just learn it by hearing. So you create eventually a, a lyrics that is different. So, but anyway, there's a lot of songs that are like that. In the New Testament, you have the example of uh, the Lord's Prayer in Matthew. In the original, probably did not contain the words, for thine is the kingdom, that portion. At least by the second century, this was added, as evidenced by the book of Tedeke, as it was prayed in private or public by Christians. To make this more concrete, at least in our experience, I today, when you pray, for example, the Angelus, you always pray it with the glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit at the end. I grew up and I was in the seminary. We were praying it without the glory be to the Father until the end. So now the tradition is that many people will automatically put glory to the Father at the end of the Angelus. So that's an example of how sometimes the oral tradition could change it. In the same way, for example, that before, when you, when you used to attend Mass, we just sing after the Mass. And then here in Metro Manila, for example, you know that people cannot help it, but they clap already at the end of the Mass. So, is a part of the tradition? Maybe now it is part, but it was not part of the tradition of the earlier tradition. So that's an example that uh, you can get out of it. So anyway, this uh, for Dine is the Kingdom was added to the text by probably by the scribes in the margins in the margins first, and then later it became part of the of the text itself. So it appears in older traditional translation but none in the modern translations except in the footnote. If you check your Bible now, you will no longer find that for dying is the kingdom written 
in the text itself after the Our Father. It is already placed in the footnote. So to be, to be able to correct, that, that is something that has been added to it. And then people at a later time when they copied the Our Father thought it was part of it and it was missing his copy, so they put it. Then the next copy that was passed on has already the ordain is the kingdom of being. So that's uh, one example of how the transmission can alter or can make some changes or additions to the text as it is. Now regarding Gospels, before the critical studies of the Gospel, they were considered biographies with eyewitnesses as sources. Today, we no longer, that is no longer an accepted view that, there, that the eyewitnesses are the ones write, are the ones who wrote basically the Gospels. Majority position today, it is difficult to construct a biography in modern sense, especially based on the Gospels alone. So it will, it will not actually be a complete one. It ended the lives of Jesus movement in the 19th century, which tried to reconstruct the life of Jesus based on the New Testament sources. So as we, have, as we study, basically, especially if you study the Synoptic Gospels, you will realize that not everything that is written in that particular in the Gospels are actually reflections of how, what really happened in the time of Jesus. I mean, exact. It, they are not exact uh, recollections or copies of what happened then. The general agreement is that the Gospels today are the final product of stages of development. So that is something that we have to be aware with regarding the Gospel. It is a product of some stages of development. Now, another aspect that we need to look into in terms of transmission, and of course translation, are the work of biblical scribes. So, of course, today with the technology, it's much easier to, to reproduce and to copy a lot of these things. But in the olden days, I think it was really very difficult, and it will really take, take some dedication to be able to do that. So some of the things that we, we need to be aware with regards to this uh, situation of the biblical scribes is that we have to accept the fact that error-free copies were impossible. And like today, if you copy, like, if you Xerox it, you practically see what you Xerox. And of course, exactly when you don't Xerox it well, you, you, you miss some of the aspects, some parts of it. But anyway, in general, it's a photocopy so that means it's really but in the but before that before all of this uh, uh what do you call this uh, technology has been invented you can never really have a copy that is uh, without error the kind of errors anyway that you look into are different kinds one is accidental errors something to do with a poor source if what you copy from is a little bit uh, already like an uh, old one and then the pages are fading and so on. Sometimes it's an intellig intelligible and then it will be difficult to actually ascertain sometimes the, what are the words that are there. So the comparison also between standard Hebrew with ancient versions. So those are actually can create in the translation. Now, aside from the accidental errors, there are also deliberate errors. For example, updating the text. Some of the copyists in history has probably made it a habit to sometimes uh, update the text. Like what I've told you earlier regarding the Our Father. The Our Father in the original text probably has only the Our Father and then for that it's the kingdom was not present. However, in the tradition, in the practice, in the liturgy, maybe they have added the uh, for that is the kingdom to the prayer. That's why in the next uh, uh, episode, maybe, the, the scribe who tried to copy the text was copying a text that was older and it doesn't contain for that in the kingdom. But he knows that in his experience, he grew up, or at least in the liturgy, he knew that after the Our Father, there is an additional prayer that is added to it for that is the kingdom. So thinking, thinking that the copy that he has is a, uh, uh, is lacking, so he tried to correct it by adding it to the text itself. So now you have a copy that is containing the Our Father plus the additional uh, for the Kingdom, which has probably been added orally, 
And then eventually, when the copy goes on, and then it is copied by someone else, then eventually you have a different copy already. And there will be different versions of the text. But expanding the text is also basically uh, uh, related to that, especially with the Lord's Prayer. Updating would probably be like correcting it, especially when it doesn't make sense already in your time. Because you don't understand it, sometimes you change it to something else. And then, of course, making it relevant to the readers. Like if you say, ah, this word is no longer used today. So we might as well change it into something that is much more modern. In the same way that, for example, the new, uh, the millennial gospel today is an attempt actually to make it relevant to the readers. Unfortunately, what is not paid attention to is that sometimes it can actually affect. Imagine if the only Bible that you are able to, to get is the millennial Bible, then you are stuck with whatever, how it is presented there. You can never check whether that is basically uh, faithful to the original if you only basically have that as basis. So that's uh, the problem. That's why sometimes the one that are the texts that are transmitted, hopefully you just hope that the copy that you get is basically closer to the original. Otherwise, you will get copies that are already modeled and sometimes have been have gone through some editing and so on. Now, we also have to realize that the scribes in their transmission and all, even in their translation as well, become interpreters and shapers of tradition. So some, sometimes they can actually, uh, what do you call this, uh, influence the text according to basically their own persuasion. That's why when we, when we do translation today, we actually say that there is already a lot of interpretation going on when you make a translation. Because there are a lot of considerations that you have to do. So anyway, so that's basically the, the scribes, um, especially also in the, in the ancient times, they were already like interpreters and shapers of tradition as well. Here is an example. In Job chapter 2 verse 9, the text there it says, in the original, I mean in the older manuscripts, it says there, curse God and die. You know the story of Job, right? When Job was stripped practically of everything and yet he still believed, you, it's, you will definitely understand and appreciate that that statement is not, is not something unusual in the context of the story of Job. But for a very long time, the copies that has been ongoing majority of the copies that has been passed on and uh, and uh, that has been transmitted has basically a version that is different from this one instead of instead of saying curse god and die many copies came out especially later copies came out with the statement bless god and die so in a way the earlier writers probably couldn't take it that someone will curse god so they took it upon themselves to actually change the text. But as textual critique was studied today, they realized that this has been ed an editing that has happened. So they corrected it back. So today, when you have new Bibles today, it's already back to first get that. Because you cannot change that. Because if, 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 you, are, if you know the context of the story of Job, you, you will not find it surprising for someone to really curse God for what happened to Job. That's why you keep it there, because it's part of, uh, it's part of reality. Even today, even today, even if we believe in God, we also curse God if, you're, if we find ourselves in difficult situations. But anyway, that has already been uh, recognized as one of, the, one of the occasions wherein scribes could be interpreters and shapers of they wanted to more or less uh, clean the clean the the Bible with uh, with statements like this one that becomes that is an affront to God. But upon upon study of the text of Job, they realized that this is actually appropriate in the context that of the story that we're talking about. The other one, the next one that we have is that of course after. After some time, after the oral tradition, they started to put them into writing. 
So here we talk about the textual traditions of the Bible. That is what would be the what would be the version, what would be the text that we should consider as more or less uh, the basis for any other translation of the Bible today. So the textual tradition of the Old Testament, we have the Masoretic text. Sometimes it's uh, nicknamed as MT. So it's just Masoretic text. So it is the standard edition of the Hebrew scriptures since the end of the first millennium C. Definitely early, but not as early as the Old Testament times. It is considered identical with the original biblical text. So early Jews and Christians thought it was dictated directly by God. But today, if you believe that, that is already a conservative position. If, if, because if you have studied the text critically, I don't think you would actually uh, feel that that is really clearly dictated by God. In the first place, the, the text that you have has some, has some problems within it. You cannot attribute it to God, who is all perfect. Otherwise, uh, God's image will be, will be uh, what we call this, uh, uh, will change or at least will diminish. So we'll have blemish anyway. Then the next one is the Dead Sea Scrolls. So the Dead Sea Scrolls actually uh, point otherwise. So that means uh, it's in that the text basically that we have is not that simple uh, to say that the critics, for example, is uh, has basically has no has no problem and so on. So, but portions of the Old Testament, except Esther have been discovered in this collection that has been discovered in the Qumran caves, the Dead Sea Scrolls. Now studies reveal that a variety of Hebrew texts came out between 300 and 100 BC. Basically, would be close to the time that, uh, that is basically the year that Alexander the Great uh, overpowered and conquered basically Palestine. More or less during the time when Jesus came. It, the tradition is actually divided into three families of, uh, of texts. You have the Palestinian, the Egyptian, and the Babylonian. Now, we have also the Septuagint. In the Hemiah's time, 5th century, the Hebrew scripture were read, but a running commentary was provided. That is mentioned in Nehemiah. So it signaled the beginning of translation. After that, after the Hebrew, you had the Greek, and after the Greek, you basically have Aramaic text and so on, precisely because of this uh, translation. In the third century, the Pentateuch was translated into Greek, perhaps in Alexandria, Egypt, as well. So this translation was later referred to as the Septuagint. It became basically the oldest and most important of the biblical versions after the Hebrew Bible. Now, translations into other languages follow. The first one, basically, that we had after, after Greek is Vulgate, the, the Latin Vulgate. The translation of St. Jerome into Latin of the Bible in the late 4th century so to, the fifth cent, to the early 5th century. Of course, uh, they're saying that there were earlier Latin translations already in existence, but they were judged to be a poor word. So that's why the one that was uh, considered was Vulgate. So Jerome was probably have been, been, has benefited basically from these early translations that has been done. So he just basically uh, corrected them and edited them to make them really uh, better translations. So St. Jerome was commissioned to translate into Latin the Bible by Pope Damasus. So basically Vulgate that's the nickname for that uh, Bible of St. Jerome. It just means vernacular or popular. Because that was basically the language of the church at the time. It became the official Bible of the Roman Catholic Church, and it was officially recognized in the Council of Trent when they actually proclaimed as well the list or the canonical list of books that we considered in the Bible. From then, from that time until 1943, it was not allowed to make translations except from the Vulgate. 
I mean within within Roman Catholic tradition. So it was only later on that in the of course uh, recently that they they have uh, allowed translations already from the original languages. But regarding the but the Protestants has their enlightenment earlier than us. So like in the early 17th, 18th, 19th century, they were already starting to uh, translate from the original uh, languages like Hebrew for the Old Testament and then Greek for the New Testament. Of course, you realize that that is necessary because if you translate from a translation, from a translation, from a translation, you know what happens. So a lot of things actually already is missing. So that's why it's always important to translate something that is original as much as possible. Now, regarding the New Testament, the textual tradition there in the New Testament, there was no favored form of text compared to the Masoretic text for the Jews. So earliest manuscripts that we have in collection in many places are in papyrus or parchment. So that's the earliest uh, materials that we have. As early as the second century, some New Testament fragments on papyri existed, usually in scrolls. It was in the second century also that New Testament codices appeared. Again, the codices are the compilation of these many books in the Old Testament uh, compiled according, uh, compiled together like a book. So that's why we always, that's why always consider the Bible as the origin of the book, the history of a uh, book itself, because how they are put together. So the New Testament codices. So two of the major codices containing all or part of the New Testament are here. Codex Sinaiticus with the Aleph the, of the Hebrew language as the, as, as the sign, and then the Codex Vaticanus, which is letter B as a sign. If you, for example, have a a Bible in the Greek language. Anyway, you can see me. You can see me, right? So I can probably show you. So if you, for example, happen to have a copy of a of a New Testament Greek, you basically have a, what you call a critical apparatus at the bottom. So this one would contain. What is what supports what manuscripts would support basically the text that I get about? So sometimes you will find these codices, codices to to support basically some some uh, decisions that the textual critics would do to in terms of what var variant they would put here in the text itself. So sometimes they would be given in their nicknames or in their signs, like the Aleph in Codex and Eticus and the letter B for the Codex Vaticanus. So the Codex uh, Sinaitic was discovered between 1844 and 1859 by Constantine von Fischendorf, a professor of New Testament at Leipzig, and it was discovered at the monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai. And legend has it, and I'm not sure if uh, that's really the story, but according to, to what I've heard, uh, this Tischendorf was visiting the monastery of St. Catherine on Mount Sinai. And he just happened to be walking by the corridor and then he saw a monk was trying to light a chimney or a, a, fir, a fireplace and he was using uh, pages of coming from a big book that they have. He was tearing the pages to be able to light uh, basically the fire. And then when he noticed it, he tried to stop the monk and said, wait, 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 what are you doing? Can I look at it? And then when he looked at it, he practically saw a codex of the New Testament, and that's they say that's Codex in Eticus. I'm sure there were probably other copies they had in the, in the library of the monastery, but to be able to see that at that point was really something because they were able to discover a compilation of the New Testament, almost like our New Testament Bible today, but with more or less uh, added some other books outside of uh, the canonical text. So that's how basically the story of Codex in Eticus happened. But anyway, that, that at the, the point is we have this copy. Then the Codex Vaticanus is made fourth century, more or less, and then it's housed in the Vatican Library since the 15th century. Now, I, I was able to basically see how it looks like, but I didn't see the original. 
I only see a facsimile, a, a exact copy of it that was reproduced already by technology. I've seen it in the library of Leuven in Belgium because they have a copy of it. I'm just, I'm just trying to imagine how much it cost them to actually get a copy, like a copy, like, like, a, like what we do when, when we clone a book, for example, in UP. You are surprised that uh, sometimes the copy that you have is much better than the original, but they look exactly the same. So that was the kind of copy that I saw in the in the in the library of uh, theology in Belgium. They have a copy of Codex Vaticanus. Anyway, today there are over five thousand manuscripts containing all or part of the New Testament. Again, I will show you basically this uh, New Testament New Testament Greek by Nestle Allen. This is already N26 edition, so that's what they have. Here at the at the back of this, uh, the box of, the, at the back of this uh, text, you'll be able to have a list of all the manuscripts that are that we have regarding the regarding the New Testament. So here you will see uh, uh, basically a a chart here but on the on this right side column. You have the name. You have the name. Here you will see it's uh, it's named with the P and the numbers. Right. The first one is P one two three four five. So it's numbered. So the reason why it's called P because it is in papyrus text. So the text is in papyrus paper. So and then here is a number that you find here. The next column determines the quality of the Greek because they are arranged into the into quality. So if you're if you are basically a good copy, then definitely you'll have you'll be at the top like one. And then the next one is the location where you can find the fragments or the text. Usually they are in the many libraries all over the world. Find it. Side the last column, you will it will indicate to you what is contained in that fragment. A fragment is not a complete uh, like a complete book. Let's say the Gospel of John. It's not a complete of John. Maybe a few chapters or only a chapter. Sometimes only a verse, very small one. But if it's basically in papyrus and it's old, definitely it's very precious. And and it can be if if you can find one, it can actually make you very rich today. And because libraries all over the world will will be competing to be able to get a copy to get hold of it. So, but anyway, you have you have those information here. So it is contained there. All of the manuscripts that we talk about, these 5,000 manuscripts, the textual critics would study to be able to reconstruct the New Testament to make it as much as possible, as close as possible to the original text. So we already mentioned that we don't have a copy of the original, unfortunately. So but what we have basically are a reconstruction from, on the basis of old manuscripts the text of uh, these different books that are in our Bible. Anyway, let's look at ancient biblical text and textual criticism. So I just mentioned that we no longer have the original text of the Bible. So to be able to get back to that earliest form of the text, one has to use the science of textual criticism. So that was uh, what I was talking to you about. So this Bible that I was showing you is definitely a, a product of textual critics. So this is already the, at least with the Nestle Allen, because there are two kinds of great texts. One is U, U, UBS and this one is uh, NT. I, I'm sorry, uh, what do you call this? Uh, NA, sorry, it's NA. And it's already 27 edition, if I'm not mistaken. This one is 26. So they have been changing it depending on what they're able to discover. So the product is what we refer to as critical text of the Old Testament and the New Testament. Text, that's usually the text. In terms of studying, because if you are studying this critical apparatus, then it gives you a lot of information regarding the text that we have. So in the Old Testament, the Masoretic text we already mentioned is still the official Bible of Judaism and remains to be the standard edition of the Biblical Hebrew text. So we have here a copy in the library of the 
of what you call the edition biblica uh, what you call this Stuttgartensia. I think that's uh, Stuttgart is in Germany. So that's where basically where it was uh, put together. So texts in critical editions of the Old Testament are these, the, some of these uh, are the texts that are critical editions. The Leningrad Codex dated to 1009 CE, it's the earliest dated complete copy of the New Testament in terms of codex. So this text is critical for as long as a critical apparatus appears below the text on each page. So I already showed you that in this in this text that I have, this N NA26. Uh, so I have here the text uh, in, in Hebrew, I'm sorry, in Greek, in this side. And then below it are basically, you can probably not see what are written there, but this is what is referred to as critical apparatus. That will explain to you basically everything that needs to be explained in the text about it. Like what do you find here? in this critical apparatus that they are mentioned. One is the evidence of other ancient versions, like the Death from what you can find from the Dead Sea Scrolls, Septuagint, and Vulgate. And then also citations from ancient authorities, like uh, the Church Fathers, if they wrote about it. And then as well, suggestions for alternative readings. Like in other manuscripts, sometimes the text that you have in the, in the, in the text itself is different from from some, some manuscripts that are found. So it is indicated in the critical apparatus. Now the standard critical text of the Old Testament is the second edition of Biblia Hebraica Stuttgart Pension, edited by K. Eliger and W. Rudolph. So we have a copy of that in the, in the library, but I wasn't able to bring it with me. I have a copy upstairs. So, um, but anyway, hopefully when you come to SBSC, you'll be able to see it. Now, regarding the New Testament, the one I was, was showing you is an example of a critical edition of the Greek New Testament. It is a scholarly reconstruction based on a textual critical evidence, not matching any one text. So that means this critical text that we have is not representing any of the available texts that are there, because this one is what is put together here is coming from all of the available manuscripts that they have. Taking into consideration basically the, the older they are, they are important uh, evidences, and of course the quality of the Greek and so on. So there are two main editions, almost identical. You have the fourth edition of the American Bible Society's Greek New Testament, so it's USB 4. And then the second one is the 27th of the Nestle Allen Novum Testamentum, NA27. One, the one that I'm showing you now is NA26. So this is the 26th edition. We have a copy in the library of the recent one. Maybe it's uh, the difference is not really that big no, uh, uh, yet today, but at least there is uh, the reason why they came up with another edition is maybe there were they added some more into the text itself. So far, sometimes we don't appreciate the work of these people who are working really on the text itself, the textual critics that we call them. The one who made, who really make sure that we have a standard copy of the Old Testament in Hebrew, as well as the New Testament in, uh, in Greek. So, but we have to actually see what the, what the fruit of their labors have been, have actually given us. A striking achievement of modern textual the critical approach is basically this one the unprecedented addition of a paragraph to the biblical text that has never appeared in any translation of the Bible for over 2,000 years. So anyway, I met, we mentioned earlier that there, we don't have a copy of the original of both the Old Testament and the New Testament. What we have are copies, several copies of many of these texts. So in the last 2,000 years, they have been reading the Old Testament basically for the last 2,000 years and never have they discovered a copy that would actually make them realize that there is actually a text that has been missing in, uh, in one of the books in the Old Testament for the last 2,000 years. And it only appeared, especially when, they, when the Dead Sea Scrolls was discovered. This text is found at the end of the first book of Samuel 10, 1027. 
It's a brief narrative about Nahash, king of the Ammonites, which is found in a fra fragmentary, although fragmentary already, that means not a complete text, but it's found in a copy that, that is included in the list of the books in the Dead Sea Scrolls. It is also supported by the writings of the Jewish historian Josephus from the first century. So anyway, the text that was that was written there has something to do with uh, the story with, with Israel being defeated by this Nahas and so on. So that's why I don't know who, who was the scribe at the beginning. They actually erased the portion of the story in the written text itself so that all of the people for the last 2,000 years was not aware that there is a portion that was uh, missing. Now, what you can do is you can probably write down this first book of Psalm 1027. And probably if your Bible text is uh, modern or recent, then you'll be able to probably find some footnotes regarding this particular text that has been missing for the last 2,000 years. And it was already only discovered when they discovered the Dead Sea Scrolls in the, four, in the 1940s. So that's basically what, uh, uh, what you call this uh, uh, textual criticism has, has given us in terms of the translation. I will stop here and then we'll just continue on with the second half uh, tomorrow. So, but before we go, I, I would just like to ask if you have any questions.